This is the Bible in one year, day 164. Your nation can be changed. There were 10,000 sex workers plying their trade on the streets of London. Binge drinking and gambling were widespread. The UK had descended into decadence and immorality. This was the 18th century. Church congregations had declined sharply, just as they have in recent decades. Parts of the church had virtually descended into paganism. Yet the church was changed. The preaching of John Wesley and George Whitfield began to take effect. Thousands of people responded to their message and encountered Jesus. Robert Rakes started his first Sunday school in 1780. The growth from this one idea reached 300,000 unchurched children within five years. By 1910, there were well over five million children in Sunday school. God raised up William Wilberforce, Lord Shaftesbury and others. Not only were individual hearts changed, but the nation was also transformed. As we look at our world today, we see it's changing faster than ever before. In the last 25 years, there has been huge change politically, economically and technologically. Massive change is taking place in many countries around the world. How can the spiritual climate of your nation be changed? From Proverbs 14. A truthful witness saves lives, but a false witness is deceitful. Whoever fears the Lord has a secure fortress, and for their children it will be a refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life turning a person from the snares of death. A large population is a king's glory, but without subjects, a prince is ruined. Whoever is patient has great understanding, but one who is quick-tempered displays folly. A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. Whoever oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker, but whoever is kind to the needy honors God. When calamity comes, the wicked are brought down, but even in death, the righteous seek refuge in God. Wisdom reposes in the heart of the discerning, and even among fools, she lets herself be known. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin condemns any people. A king delights in a wise servant, but a shameful servant arouses his fury. Peaceful people. The writer of Proverbs says, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. Sin destroys a nation. God devotion makes a country strong. Righteousness involves a range of right relationships. First, peace with God. Righteousness starts with making peace with God. It starts with the fear of the Lord in the good sense of proper respect for the Lord. The fear of God builds up confidence and makes a world safe for your children. The fear of God is a spring of living water. Second, peace with others. As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Right relationships with others are characterized by righteous words and actions. Our words are to be truthful rather than deceitful, for a truthful witness saves lives. Our actions are to display a desire for well-being of others. Be patient rather than quick-tempered. Be kind to those in need. You insult your maker when you exploit the powerless. When you're kind to the poor, you honor God. Display your delight towards those who act in wisdom. Third, peace with ourselves. Righteousness involves a right relationship with ourselves. You can know peace. A calm and undisturbed mind and heart are the life and health of the body. Anger, lack of forgiveness, envy and jealousy can damage your physical body. Getting rid of the bad stuff in your life and having a heart at peace is good for your health. Ultimately, this peace comes from being content about both the present and the future. For even in death, the righteous have a refuge. For those who fear in the Lord, he becomes our refuge in the present and the future. Lord, I pray that our nation will turn back to you and that the name of the Lord will be respected again in parliament, government, schools and law courts. 
Help us to prioritize the poor and be kind to the needy. New Testament from Acts 8. Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Now for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized. And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Peter answered, May your money perish with you, because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me, so that nothing you have said may happen to me. After they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means Queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, Go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, 
the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. And the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Powerful preaching. The early church was made up of ordinary people like you and me, yet it changed the world. The whole known world was transformed following the death and resurrection of Jesus and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. The book of Acts tells us how this happened. Everywhere they went, they preached the message about Jesus. In this passage, we see that they preached to crowds and to individuals like Simon the sorcerer and the Ethiopian eunuch. Nations are comprised of cities, towns and villages. They preached the gospel in all three. Philip preached in the city in Samaria. Peter and John preached the gospel in the Samaritan villages. Philip preached the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Their preaching was accompanied and indeed accelerated by three factors. First, persecution. It began with persecution. Those who were being scattered preached the word wherever they went. The dispersion brought great blessing. Everywhere they went, they proclaimed the Christ. Again and again in the history of the church, persecution and opposition have led to unexpected fruitfulness. It's easy to lose heart when we experience setbacks, but this reminds us that God can use them in amazing ways. Second, prayer. We see in this passage the importance of prayer. Peter and John prayed for the Samaritans that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Simon was a notorious magician who dazzled everyone with his wizardry and had everyone eating out of his hands. He himself believed and was baptized, but following his old ways, he wanted to buy the Holy Spirit. Peter was unimpressed. To hell with your money. Ask the master to forgive you for trying to use God to make money. I can see this as an old habit with you. You reek with money lust. Simon realized that only the Lord could save him and asked them to pray for him. Third, power. The early church was characterized by enormous effectiveness. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. They were totally reliant on the Holy Spirit. Philip's encounter with the Ethiopian was not the result of a strategic planning meeting. Rather, the Spirit told Philip the result of him following the leading of the Holy Spirit was the remarkable conversion of the Ethiopian, which has affected the whole nation of Ethiopia right down to the present day. The church that was birthed that day has never died out in that nation. The Holy Spirit is the agent of change. He can bring about change in a nation. That change starts with the change in the lives of people. It's worth noting the factors involved in the change in this Ethiopian. The Spirit of God prepared his heart. The Ethiopian is honest about his ignorance, searching for answers, and not too proud to ask for help. There's no shame in not always understanding what you read in the Bible. It's wise to get help from trusted people or Bible commentaries to help you apply it to your life. The Spirit of God is at work through the Word of God. It is as the Ethiopian looks at the book of Isaiah that he begins to find answers. Often, the Holy Spirit uses a human agent to help us open up, explain, and apply the scriptures. This is what happened here. Beginning with Isaiah 53, Philip explains the good news about Jesus. The Holy Spirit changes the heart of the Ethiopian in such a radical and complete way that he believes immediately and asks to be baptized. There is no more powerful an agent of change than the Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to be more like the early church. Help us to pray more and to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit day by day. I pray that our nation would be transformed as people come to know you. Old Testament from 2 Samuel 20 and 21. Now a troublemaker named Sheba, son of Bichri, a Benjaminite, happened to be there. He sounded the trumpet and shouted, We have no share in David, no part in Jesse's son. 
Every man to his tent, Israel. So all the men of Israel deserted David to follow Sheba, son of Bichri. But the men of Judah stayed by their king all the way from the Jordan to Jerusalem. When David returned to his palace in Jerusalem, he took the ten concubines he had left to take care of the palace and put them in a house under guard. He provided for them but had no sexual relations with them. They were kept in confinement till the day of their death, living as widows. Then the king said to Amasa, Summon the men of Judah to come to me within three days and be here yourself. But when Amasa went to summon Judah, he took longer than the time the king had set for him. David said to Abishai, Now Sheba, son of Bichri, will do us more harm than Absalom did. Take your master's men and pursue him, or he will find fortified cities and escape from us. So Joab's men and the Kirathites and the Pelathites and all the mighty warriors went out under the command of Abishai. They marched out from Jerusalem to pursue Sheba, son of Bichri. While they were at the great rock in Gibeon, a mesa came to meet them. Joab was wearing his military tunic, and strapped over it at his waist was a belt with a dagger in its sheath. As he stepped forward, it dropped out of its sheath. Joab said to Amasa, How are you, my brother? Then Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. Amasa was not on his guard against the dagger in Joab's hand, and Joab plunged it into his belly, and his intestines spilled out onto the ground. Without being stabbed again, Amasa died. Then Joab and his brother Abishai pursued Sheba, son of Bichri. One of Joab's men stood beside Amasa and said, Whoever favors Joab, and whoever is for David, let him follow Joab. Amasa lay wallowing in his blood in the middle of the road, and the man saw that all the troops came to a halt there. When he realized that everyone who came up to Amasa stopped, he dragged him from the road into a field and threw a garment over him. After Amasa had been removed from the road, everyone went on with Joab to pursue Sheba, son of Bichri. Sheba passed through all the tribes of Israel to Abel Beth Meacah, and through the entire region of the Bichrites, who gathered together and followed him. All the troops with Joab came and besieged Sheba in Abel Beth Meacah. They built a siege ramp up to the city and it stood against the outer fortifications. While they were battering the wall to bring it down, a wise woman called from the city, Listen, listen, tell Joab to come here so that I can speak to him. He went towards her, and she asked, Are you Joab? I am, he answered. She said, Listen to what your servant has to say. I'm listening, he said. She continued, Long ago, they used to say, get your answer at Abel, and that settled it. We are the peaceful and faithful in Israel. You are trying to destroy a city that is a mother in Israel. Why do you want to swallow up the Lord's inheritance? Far be it from me, Joab replied. Far be it from me to swallow up or destroy. That is not the case. A man named Sheba, son of Bichri, from the hill country of Ephraim, has lifted up his hand against the king against David. Hand over this one man, and I'll withdraw from the city. The woman said to Joab, His head will be thrown to you from the wall. Then the woman went to all the people with her wise advice, and they cut off the head of Sheba, son of Bichri, and threw it to Joab. So he sounded the trumpet, and his men dispersed from the city, each returning to his home. And Joab went back to the king in Jerusalem. Joab was over Israel's entire army. Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, was over the Kerathites and the Pelathites. Adoniram was in charge of forced labor. Jehoshaphat, son of Ahilud, was recorder. Shiva was secretary. Zadok and Abiathar were priests. And Ira the Jairite was David's priest. 2 Samuel chapter 21 During the reign of David, there was a famine for three successive years. So David sought the face of the Lord. The Lord said, It is on account of Saul and his blood-stained house. It is because he put the Gibeonites to death. 
The king summoned the Gibeonites and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not a part of Israel, but were survivors of the Amorites. The Israelites had sworn to spare them, but Saul, in his zeal for Israel and Judah, had tried to annihilate them. David asked the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you? How shall I make atonement, so that you will bless the Lord's inheritance? The Gibeonites answered him, We have no right to demand silver or gold from Saul or his family, nor do we have the right to put anyone in Israel to death. What do you want me to do for you? David asked. They answered the king, As for the man who destroyed us, and plotted against us, so that we have been decimated and have no place anywhere in Israel, let seven of his male descendants be given to us to be killed, and their bodies exposed before the Lord and Gibeah of Saul, the Lord's chosen one. So the king said, I will give them to you. The king spared Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the oath before the Lord between David and Jonathan, son of Saul. But the king took Armoni and Mephibosheth, the two sons of Aiah's daughter, Rizpah, whom she had borne to Saul, together with the five sons of Saul's daughter, Mirab, whom she had borne to Adriel, son of Barzillai, the Maholathite. He handed them over to the Gibeonites, who killed them and exposed their bodies on a hill before the Lord. All seven of them fell together. They were put to death during the first days of harvest, just as the barley harvest was beginning. Rizpah, daughter of Ea, took sackcloth and spread it out for herself on a rock. From the beginning of the harvest till the rain poured down from the heavens on the bodies, she did not let the birds touch them by day or the wild animals by night. When David was told what Ea's daughter Rizpah, Saul's concubine, had done, he went and took the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan from the citizens of Jabesh Gilead. They had stolen their bodies from the public square at Bethshan, where the Philistines had hung them after they struck Saul down on Gilboa. David brought the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan from there, and the bones of those who had been killed and exposed were gathered up. They buried the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan in the tomb of Saul's father Kish at Zila in Benjamin, and did everything the king commanded. After that, God answered prayer on behalf of the land. Once again, there was a battle between the Philistines and Israel. David went down with his men to fight against the Philistines, and he became exhausted. And Ishbi Benob, one of the descendants of Rapha, whose bronze spearhead weighed 300 shekels, and who was armed with a new sword, said he would kill David. But Abishai, son of Zeruiah, came to David's rescue. He struck the Philistine down and killed him. Then David's men swore to him, saying, Never again will you go out with us in battle, so that the lamp of Israel will not be extinguished. In the course of time, there was another battle with the Philistines at Gob. At that time, Sipakai, the Hushathite, killed Saf, one of the descendants of Rapha. In another battle with the Philistines at Gob, Elhanan, son of Jair, the Bethlehemite, killed the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, who had a spear with a shaft like a weaver's rod. In still another battle which took place at Gath, there was a huge man with six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot, twenty-four in all. He also was descended from Repha. When he taunted Israel, Jonathan, son of Shimea, David's brother, killed him. There were four descendants of Repha in Gath and they fell at the hands of David and his men. Passionate prayer. The battles in David's life never seem to come to an end. In today's passage, we see two further battles. First, there's a troublemaker named Sheba. This is an echo of David's struggle with Absalom. The people of Israel seem extremely fickle. All the men of Israel deserted David to follow Sheba. The Lord gave David victory over Sheba, but immediately there's another battle around the corner. There was a famine for three consecutive years. As the nation faced disaster, David sought the face of the Lord. Sometimes it takes a real disaster to get us on our knees. God spoke to him as he prayed. He held Israel to the promise that was made to the Gibeonites. In spite of the promise, Saul had tried to annihilate them, but the O's 
that are made to God are very important and cannot be broken lightly. The most common oaths today are in the marriage service and oaths in court. Only after David had put things right and honored the oath made to God did God answer prayer on behalf of the land. Lord, I seek your face on behalf of our nation. Have mercy upon us. Help us to be a nation that honors you with faithfulness to our marriage vows and truthfulness in our law courts. Lord, would you once again answer prayer on behalf of the land. May our nation be turned back to you. May your name be honored. May your kingdom come. Pepper adds, in Acts 8, verse 39, it says, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus. I don't know whether it would be exciting or terrifying or useful to be at HDB in London one minute and the next minute to be in Brighton. It only happens to me when I drive off absent-mindedly and find myself in totally the wrong place. 